Well, tonight we come to section 13 of our study. Um, we're going kind of through a, an overview of Scripture, a, a systematic theology, kind of an overview of theology found in our doctrinal statement in our Constitution. We're going to come to section 13 tonight, which is the section on dispensationalism. And some of you might say, well, there's a $10 word. Um, what does that mean? Well, hopefully by the end of tonight, that will become a more familiar word to you, and you'll understand its importance. There are two basic approaches to interpreting, especially the prophetic passages of the Bible. They're known as the covenantal approach and then the dispensational approach. So there's basically two different grids or approaches or methods or systems that Bible teachers use to interpret the Bible. And at first glance, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference between them, but as you go down a little deeper and look at it, you see that there are some significant differences. Covenant theology is usually the approach used in Presbyterian churches, in Lutheran churches, and in Reformed churches, while the dispensational approach is more commonly found in Bible churches such as ours, in Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, Calvary Chapel churches, and many, many others. Paul Benoit, whose book I recommended last time, if you remember in our, in our study of eschatology, I recommended his book called Understanding End Times Prophecy. And he gives a very helpful illustration to kind of introduce this idea of these two systems. He compares it to two airplanes that are sitting on the tarmac at the gate. They both look pretty much the same from the outside. They both have a lot of similarities. And there doesn't really even seem to, you know, why does it even matter which one you get on? But as you know, it does matter whether you get on gate 11 or gate 12, right? Because those two planes are going to two very different directions. And so the difference really emerges as you go farther down the road or on the journey. What I want to do tonight is, instead of kind of evaluating the systems themselves, I want to take a little bit of a look on where they lead. I want to just talk about the destinations that covenant theology and dispensational theology takes you to. So I want to begin with covenant theology. Where does covenant theology take you if you utilize this approach and this system? First of all, covenant theology leads to a belief that the children of believers are guaranteed salvation. Now, I'm not sure every covenant theologian would put it in exactly those terms, but there is this idea that believers partake of the covenant, and therefore their children partake of the covenant. They look at the Old Testament, and they see that the covenant was given to Israel. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant, and if, a par if parents would faithfully have their, their sons circumcised, that meant the next generation came under God's blessings of the covenant with Israel. And they take that, and they basically impose it onto the New Testament. They say that baptism replaces circumcision as the sign of the covenant. And so if you have your baby baptized, that is a, a basically a way that you guarantee that he is now in the covenant of God, and God will save that child sometime in his lifetime. So there is a belief that the children of believers are essentially guaranteed salvation. It's just a matter of time to when they will come to faith in Christ. There's not really a question about it. That's why you'll hear words like confirmation, right? It's not, they're not actually being converted, they're just being confirmed in the covenant. It also leads to infant baptism, as I mentioned, right? Because they believe that basically baptism is the sign of the covenant, just like circumcision was. And so, just as babies were circumcised, now babies should be baptized. It leads also to the belief that God has rejected Israel and replaced it with the church. The church, in this view, is the new Israel, and there's no future for ethnic or national Israel. The church has replaced it, and every promise, at least all of the good promises given to Israel in the Old Testament, will be spiritually or allegorically fulfilled in the church. And that's then the fourth and, and very vital uh, aspect of covenant theology, is they believe that prophetic passages should be interpreted, they would say spiritually, we would say allegorically. In other words, you can't take it at face value. It has some sort of a typological 
or allegorical or spiritual interpretation. Dispensationalism, on the other hand, takes you to the following destinations. First of all, a belief that children of believers still need to be evangelized. In other words, every human being has to come to the point of believing in Christ, of being converted, and that 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 occasion is not guaranteed. Now, there's, you, we have the proverb, you know, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. There are some great promises given to the, to the parents of, of, you know, of believing families. There's some great grace given because these children are surrounded by the preaching of the gospel. They benefit from the grace that God gives in the church. However, there is not a belief that it is a guaranteed result with the children. And so the dispensationalists would say that the children of believers still need to be evangelized. And so parents who would be in more in the dispensational mindset, they will pray fervently for their children's salvation. The children's programs and dispensational churches will work very diligently to evangelize the children, not just catechize them, right? So in a covenantal church, the, the idea is catechism, at the, for, for children when in dispensational churches, the idea is evangelism, right? Because there is not an assumption made that all of the children already are part of this covenant of salvation. Dispensational theology also leads then to believer's baptism, right? Since the person has to come to personal faith in Christ, then they need to be baptized as a personal and public profession of their faith. We believe in believer's baptism. Third is the belief that all of God's promises to Israel, ethnic and national Israel, will still be fulfilled. Now, there are some prophetic passages in the Old Testament relating to Israel that have already been fulfilled, but there are many. In fact, throughout the major and the minor prophets, prophets there are many, many prophecies given to Israel that have not yet been fulfilled. Now, the covenant theologian says, well, they'll be fulfilled spiritually or allegorically in the church. The dispensationalist says, no, they will be fulfilled literally and exactly in the millennial kingdom in the future. So there's still a future for ethnic Israel. And so the, the fourth and last point is that dispensational theology leads you to a literal interpretation of prophetic passages. So as you can see, the destinations of the two theological systems are very, very different in areas such as the ordinances of the church, right? Baptism and even communion. In areas of theology, of hermeneutics, or how we interpret the Bible. And then even things very practical such as parenting and the emphasis of children's programs in churches. Now here at, C uh, at Calvary Bible, we teach a dispensational approach to theology because we believe in a consistent, literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic. So I want to begin our study by looking at section 13 of our doctrinal statement, which gives a good definition and summary of the dispensational approach and what we teach here at CBC. It begins this way. It says, we believe that God progressively reveals truth about himself and his purposes to mankind in stages throughout distinct periods of history. These periods are called dispensations. The content of God's revelation progressively expands with each period, right? And this is very self-explanatory, right? I mean, if you were living in the time of, of Moses, you, had a, you did not have the New Testament, for example, right? If you were living in the time of, of the later prophets, you, you didn't have the New Testament prophets. So God progressively reveals truth about himself and his purposes to mankind in stages throughout distinct periods of history. These periods are called dispensations, and the content of God's revelation progressively expands with each period. Statement goes on to say, in every dispensation, God calls upon mankind to believe in him and to obey his word. In every dispensation, people are saved by grace through faith in God's promises. Right? So you have multiple dispensations, but one way of salvation. Statement goes on to say, further, we further believe, let's see if I can advance the slide there, we further believe that the promises God made to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament will be literally fulfilled to Israel in the future kingdom. And then fourth and finally, we reject any teaching that equates the New Testament church with Old Testament Israel, which is covenant theology, 
and any teaching that rejects water baptism and or the Lord's Supper as ordinances for the church today, something called hyper-dispensationalism. We'll speak about that briefly at the end. So I want to, what I want you to do, it, to do is just kind of take the doctrinal statement and just kind of point out there are four key premises present in that doctrinal statement that I just want to take you through and discuss. Four major premises regarding dispensationalism versus covenantalism. The first is that there are distinct stages or dispensations that are clearly evident in Scripture, right? That's the first premise, that there are clearly distinct or clearly evident and distinct stages or dispensations revealed in Scripture. Secondly, in all of those stages or dispensations, people are saved the same way, by grace through faith. Third premise, God will faithfully keep every promise he made to Israel, and that fact should increase our confidence that he will keep every promise he made to the church. If he kept his promises to ethnic Israel, if he is faithful to complete and to literally fulfill every promise that he makes to Israel, that gives us great confidence that he will also literally, not figuratively, but literally fulfill all of the promises that he makes to us in the church. Fourth premise is that extreme theological positions have negative practical effects, right? How you think and how you believe determines how you live, right? Out of good theology flows good living. Out of bad theology flows negative practical effects. So let's look at the first premise. Premise number one, distinct stages or dispensations are clearly evident in Scripture. Now, you know, the older generation would say, hey, dispensationalism, hey, that is a $10 word, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a biggie. And so it, it does sound strange. And because it sounds strange or uncommon to people, sometimes people say it kind of sounds like something some theologian must have just made up, right? And so there's a little bit of a, of a challenge, you know, because the theological term is dispensation, and it's an uncommon or unfamiliar word to people. And so it kind of gives them this idea of, well, it's maybe not really biblical, but really, the word dispensation is just the word that the King James Version, which was the standard version for many, many years in the English world, the word dispensation is the word that the King James Version uses at least 20 times to translate the Greek word oikonomia, which modern translations translate with a little less obscure terms such as administration or stewardship or economy or commission. So to use the wording of our doctrinal statement, a dispensation is simply a distinct period in history in which God reveals truths about himself and his purposes and reveals the responsibilities that people have in their relationship to him. Charles Ryrie, who kind of wrote the classic work on dispensationalism, defined dispensations as this a distinguishable economy or administration, a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's purpose, right? So in other words, it's a very simple idea. There's just a distinguishable way that God relates to people at a certain period in time. Paul Benoit, whose book I continually recommend because it's such a good one and such a good summary, it goes through all of the biblical covenants, then it goes through the differences between dispensationalism and covenantalism, it goes through all of eschatology, does a really good job of dealing with the text. He gives it the definition that I prefer because it uses more modern terminology. He says, a dispensation is a stewardship or administration of God in this world. It's just a way that God implements his will and his reign in this world. In other words, God, as the ruler of all, has used different means and systems to implement his rule and his will among men at different periods of time in redemptive history. So, for example, and I think this is, 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 is very uh, accessible to any believer, right? The way that God implemented his rule and his will and the way he revealed it was different in the Garden of Eden than it was after the fall of man, right? In the Garden of Eden, God is walking with Adam and Eve, and he's talking with them, and, and he only has one rule for them, right? Don't eat of the tree of life. And then the way that he implemented his rule and will had distinguishably different features after the flood and then also after his covenant with Abraham, right? We can see these distinct changes or markers or stages in the revelation of God and in how 
he relates to man, what he requires of man. The way he implemented his rule and will in the time of Moses and of the theocratic kingdom of Israel is different than how he implements his rule and will now in the church age. And how he implements his rule and will now is different than how he will do so in the millennial kingdom. So although the word dispensationalism sounds really complicated, it's actually quite simple. It comes from that word found 20 times in the New Testament and describes something that even I think a child notices as they read the Bible from cover to cover, which is that God interacts with people in distinct ways in different periods of history. That's why Lewis Ferry Schaefer once said, any person is a dispensationalist who trusts the blood of Christ rather than bringing in animal sacrifice. He went on to say, any person is a dispensationalist who observes the first day of the week rather than the seventh. Right? In other words, he's just saying, as we read Scripture, we very clearly see differences between how a believer, for example, in the Old Testament was to live and interact with God, and then how a believer in the New Testament under the New Covenant in the church age should interact and, and obey God. Right? There are different responsibilities given to people in different epochs of history. So, Schaefer's point is that even covenantal theologians, those who are very critical of dispensationalism, they cannot deny the core idea of dispensationalism, which is that God has implemented His divine rule among men in different ways, in different epochs of of redemptive history. So, our first premise is actually a simple and easily provable one. There are distinct stages or dispensations that are clearly evident in Scripture. Let's read our doctrinal statement again. We believe that God progressively reveals truth about himself and his purposes to mankind in stages throughout distinct periods of history. These periods are called dispensations. The content of God's revelation progressively expands with each period, right? So, you know, first he gives through Moses the first five books of the Bible, right? And then the prophets begin to write. And then you have the major prophets, the minor prophets, right? Then you have the New Testament period. God is revealing more of his will, and he is revealing more of his ways to man. Now, classical dispensational theologians typically speak of seven dispensations, seven distinct periods. You can see them up there on the screen. They are pre-fall, right? The Garden of Eden before the fall of man into sin. Then the period of conscience, right? When there, were no, there was no scripture, but God had written his law on man's heart. The period of conscience. Then of government, when God instituted government to restrain sin. Then the patriarchal period, right? Where God was leading through Abraham, through the patriarchs as they led according to the promises of God. Then the Mosaic law, right? The law at Sinai, the theocratic kingdom of Israel. Then the church age, which we're in right now, and then in the future, the millennial kingdom. So, you know, traditionally there have been seven dispensations identified. So I just want to kind of go through these and just give a brief explanation of each one. Number one, in the pre-fall dispensation, there was no written revelation, right? There was no Bible in the pre-fall dispensation, right? God is speaking to Adam and Eve in the garden directly, walking with them in the cool of the day, and he gives them only one law to obey, right? So, so here you have a very distinct uh, situation in regard to God's revelation to man, his relationship to man, and his requirements of man. So that's the pre-fall dispensation. Obviously, there's a huge change that comes after the fall of man into sin in terms of how man relates to God. After the fall, the dispensation of conscience began, right? There is still no written revelation, right? Because Moses hasn't written the book of Genesis through Deuteronomy yet. That comes at the time of the Exodus later on. There's no written revelation yet, but as Paul explains in Romans chapter 2, God had written his law on the hearts of man, right? Paul in in Romans chapter 2 says, look, hey, even those that don't have the scripture, they still have God's law because he wrote it on their heart. He endowed it into their conscience. And so this is the era of conscience. There's no written revelation of God, but his law is written on the hearts of man and they had access to truth that was passed down to them from Adam and Eve through their children and their children's children. Then third, you have the epoch or the stage or the dispensation of government. If you remember, you know, you know, people 
reject conscience, right? They start to, to twist and thwart everything, and, and it gets so bad, God judges the world by sending the flood, saves Noah, right? And after Noah is saved, God creates a covenant with him, a promise to him. And one of the aspects of that covenant, which is described in Genesis chapter 9, is that God says that if, if man sheds the blood of man, he says, by man his blood must be shed. In other words, as Paul describes in Romans chapter 13, this is when God places the sword in the hand of human government, right? This is the first institution by God, the first delegation of authority of this kind by God to human governments. And Paul explains in Romans chapter 13 that God ordained the governing authorities and he put a sword in their hand to punish evildoers. Right? In other words, God, because he, he saw how wicked man's heart was, that man would express his wickedness in incredible ways, he said, I'm going to create a restraining influence. I'm going to create the, the institution of government. I'm going to endow it with authority, hand it the sword, and it is going to be my means of trying to limit or control evil. I've always said that, you know, all human governments, right, all, you know, anything that has to do with human beings, you're going to find injustice and sin in human governments. But do you know what the most unjust and wicked form of human society is and ever has been in history? It's anarchy, right? Anarchy. When there is no government, there is no control, because what it means is there's no one to stop the most evil amongst us. And it means that whoever can get the most power, right, the, you know, the, the, the strongest thug or the strongest criminal then begins to dominate and rule over all of the others. So you have this dispensation where God institutes government in the time of Noah. Then number fourth, you have the patriarchal period, right? Genesis chapter 12. Into history, God reaches down and he calls Abraham out of Ur and sends him off to the promised land. This is the beginning of the patriarchal period. The patriarchs were given revelation by God and the responsibility to lead their families, their clans, in worship of God, to keep his moral laws, to practice the sacrificial system. God was leading or implementing his rule and his will through the patriarchs. Then you have in Exodus chapter 20, the beginning of the Mosaic period, right? Where God calls, Mo, you know, the, the descendants of Abraham now have been in slavery in, in Egypt, and now God sends Moses to free his people. He leads them out to Mount Sinai, and out at Mount Sinai, he makes what's called the Mosaic covenant with his people. He gives them the written revelation of the Ten Commandments. Right? So now God begins to write his revelation down in the Ten Commandments. He inspires Moses through the Holy Spirit to take pen and to write the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, called the Pentateuch. So God gives Israel the written revelation of the Ten Commandments. He gives them the Pentateuch. He makes a covenant with them at Sinai and thus inaugurates the Mosaic dispensation in which the theocratic kingdom of Israel was the focus of God's rule and will in the world, right? Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. It was supposed to be the dwelling place of God where his rule and his will would spread out from Israel to all the world. And then we get to the New Testament period, right, to the church age. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit, right, Christ has been crucified, dies, and, and rises again, ascends to heaven. In Acts chapter 2, the helper comes, right, the comforter, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and the dispensation of the church begins, which is the period of time that we're living in today. There is one more dispensation still to come, the seventh and final for this world, at least, which is the millennial kingdom, Right? The final dispensation comes before the present heavens and earth are destroyed, right? So after the millennial reign of, of Christ, there's a final satanic rebellion, and then God casts the devil into the lake of fire, and then the present heavens and earth are destroyed, and the new heavens and earth are created, and the eternal state begins. But before the eternal state is the millennial kingdom, which is the seventh and final dispensation, the millennial reign of Christ where Jesus will rule and reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem for a thousand years.
And when you read the Old Testament and New Testament prophecies about the millennial kingdom, you'll see that there are some similarities to what, the way that God is interacting in the church age, but there are some really, really significant differences as well. Now, I want to just pause for a second and, and, you know, kind of notice something on the screen. Notice how I kind of used the different colors and then kind of I put the three blue ones kind of in the same column. The reason I did that is because not all dispensational uh, theologians think that there are seven distinct dispensations. There are some who believe that, for example, that the, that the era of conscience of the, that, that the area of conscience, the governmental and the patriarchal period are really more subsets of one of one dispensation, and so they would kind of divide it up into five periods. And there's, frankly, not a lot of difference between that. It's just more kind of how you organize it or group it. So those who hold the five dispensations would say you have the pre-fall dispensation, then the conscience dispensation. Those are the ones in the blue, then the mosaic, and then the church, and then the millennial. But as I said, the difference between those are, are quite minor. So we believe here that the Scripture very clearly indicates distinguishable and noticeable differences in how God reveals His will, how He implements His reign, and what He requires of man at different periods of history. So that is premise number one. Now let's look at premise number two. Premise number two is that in all of those stages, people are saved the exact same way, by grace through faith, by grace through faith. Our doctrinal statement puts it well. In every dispensation, God calls upon mankind to believe in Him and to obey His Word. In every dispensation, people are saved by grace through faith in God's promises. All right, so God has worked in unique and different ways in each of the seven dispensations, but the way of salvation has always been the same. It is by grace through faith. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 4 where we're going to see this very clearly uh, explained. Romans chapter 4. In this passage, Paul is going to talk about individuals who lived in different dispensations than the church age, right? They lived before Christ, but he is going to argue that they were saved by faith just as we are. Romans chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 16. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness." Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is also no violation. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Right? Do you see the argumentation in this passage? It's saying there has always been and will always be only one way of salvation. That is, by God's grace, through faith. Faith. 
The passage clearly shows that in the dispensation in which Abraham lived, salvation was by grace through faith. In the dispensation in which David lived, salvation was by grace through faith. It was the same for them as it is for us today. It is by grace through faith. It it was not by works, either for them nor for us. So I want you to kind of remember a phrase. There are several dispensations, but only one way of salvation. Several distinct periods in how God worked in the world, but only one means of, or one way of salvation. For believers who lived before Christ, their faith was in God's promise of coming redemption. Right? One of the very first promises given by God to man was when God said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that there was coming a seed of the woman who would crush Satan. Right? This is the first promise of the coming Savior, the coming Messiah. And so from the garden, from Adam and Eve, they were saved by grace through faith in God's promise of this coming Messiah who would undo that which happened at the fall. Believers who lived before Christ placed their faith in God's promise of coming redemption. Believers who live after Christ place their faith in God's provision of accomplished redemption, right? So before the cross, they're looking forward to coming redemption. After the cross, they're looking at accomplished redemption. But both are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it is only His perfect and finished sacrifice and sufficient sacrifice that can bring forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22 says very clearly, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. So in all the dispensations before Christ, if you think about it, right, there's a common denominator. There is sacrifice. There is the shedding of blood. Animal sacrifices foreshadowed and point to the final sacrifice made by Christ. Right? So when Adam and Eve sins, God slays an animal and clothes them in the skins of an animal. Noah makes sacrifices. Abraham makes sacrifices. The Mosaic law formalized the sacrificial system, and it foreshadowed and pointed to the perfect sacrifice that Christ would make. So Old Testament saints in the dispensations before the church age were saved the same way we are, by faith in the sacrificial atonement of the Messiah. For them, it was faith in the coming Messiah. For us, it is faith in the Messiah who has come. The author of Hebrews explains this in chapter 10. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, where this is clearly laid out for us. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. For the law since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Right? So you have the Old Testament saints. By faith, because God commands it, they're bringing the sacrifices, right? They're obeying God and they're bringing the sacrifices. But notice what he says. He says those Old Testament sacrifices were the shadow of the good things to come right? You have, it's it's like the Messiah is coming, and you first see his shadow before he arrives, right? You see the shadow come, and then the substance. And he says that those shadows, they couldn't take away sin. Verse 2, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In other words, the sacrificial system provided temporary coverings for those whose faith was in the final and the perfect sacrifice of the coming Messiah. Verse 5, Therefore, when he comes into the world, right, Jesus the Son, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. In other words, Jesus is coming now in the flesh and saying, All of those sacrifices pointed to me. And now the incarnate Son of God now gives his life as that 
final sacrifice, which was pictured by the earlier sacrifices. Verse 9, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. All right? If you have any doubts that dispensations are taught in the Bible, here's your verse, right? He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And then verse 10, such a vital verse. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, right? There's a change here, right? After those days, here's the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. We don't bring the animal sacrifices anymore, right? I'm up here declaring to you the finished work of Christ, not picturing for you the coming work of Christ, right? If we were in the Old Testament dispensations, I would be up here sacrificing an animal to picture for you the coming reality. But since that reality has come, now we simply proclaim the good news of what Jesus has done for us. So as our second premise states, in all the dispensations, people are saved the same way, by grace, through faith in Jesus the Messiah. As God revealed more and more in the Old Testament, people had a clearer and clearer picture of who the Messiah would be, where he would be born, what he would be like, what he would do to take away sins. But they were saved by faith, just as we are. I want you to pause for a moment and think, how blessed we are. God is only asking of us to have faith in what has already occurred and been accomplished. The Old Testament saints were asked to believe in what God will do. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes I read the Old Testament, you know, and there's, you know, you read, there's these miracles, right? I mean, you know, there's, there's all of these very dramatic, miraculous interventions of God, and we think, boy, it'd be so much easier to believe if I was back then, and I was, you know, I was seeing, you know, Daniel in the lion's den, or, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, or I was seeing some of those great miracles. I was seeing the Red Sea parted. It would be so much easier to believe Really? Really? Think about how little they knew at that time. They were clinging by faith to small, not yet finished revelations of God that were given as prophet came and revealed a little more and another prophet came and revealed a little more. We have the incredible privilege of having the finished revelation. What God asks of us is so much easier, in my opinion, than what he asked of them. Well, what about our third premise? Our third premise. God will faithfully keep every promise he made to Israel, and that fact increases our confidence that he will keep every promise he made to the church. Can I tell you something? Covenant theology frightens me. Not in, not in the sense that, it, that I think it's, you know, oh, so terrible and the people who believe it are heretics. No, not at all. I have very good friends and there are very godly men and women of God who hold the covenant theology. We're not trying to disparage them. But here's the way in which covenant theology scares me. If the promises God made to Israel will not be literally fulfilled to them, 
what confidence can I have that the promises made to the church will be literally fulfilled to us? In other words, I think what's really at, at, at stake here is the faithfulness of God. Is He a covenant-keeping God, a promise-keeping God? Or did He reach a point with Israel where He said, that's enough, they've gone too far, they even rejected my son, at least most of them, so I'm going to reject them. I'm going to set them aside. Every promise that I gave to them, I'm now going to give to the church. I don't believe that that's God's heart in regard to his people. Our doctrinal statement puts it this way. We believe that the promises God made to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament will be literally fulfilled to Israel in the future kingdom. Is Israel in disobedience? Yes. Are they experiencing the, the discipline of the Lord that was promised also to them? Yes. But there are good and precious promises throughout the Old Testament given to Israel that have not yet be fulfilled, and I believe God will keep his promise. There are whole books that focus just kind of on this question, right? Covenant theologians say that the church has replaced Israel we believe that Israel and the church are distinct. There's whole books written about this that you can read if you would like to. But what I want to do is just look at one passage, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I want to just kind of go through this passage and help you to see God's heart and his faithfulness even to those who are disobedient. And as we, as we see in the Old Testament, right, Israel at times was obedient, and then they were disobedient, and there's all of this. That's our story too, isn't it? Personally and corporately, God does not cast them ultimately aside. Look at Romans chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Right, there's the question. Has he rejected his people? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? In other words, at the time of Elijah, there was a time where Elijah thought that the entire nation had rejected God down to the very last man, and so therefore God was going to reject them. So Elijah says, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They have turned down your altars. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. Verse 4, but what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. This is very significant. Covenant theologians say that when Israel rejected Christ, right, when they shouted, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar, let his blood be on us and on our children, covenant theologians say that, that God rejected Israel because they rejected him. But Paul says, not so, not so. Not all of Israel rejected the Messiah. He says, in the same way then, just like there were a remnant in the time of Elijah, there's a remnant in the time of Christ, there has come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. So did the majority of Israel reject the Messiah? Yes, they did. But Paul is saying there is a remnant and I'm proof. I'm proof. He said in verse 1, I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 11, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, right? So in other words, it was not a complete fall. There was a remnant who stood and believed. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? 
But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection, right now he's speaking of the unbelieving part of Israel, not the remnant, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off, notice some, not all, if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Right? Right? This is a verse for those who believe that the church has replaced Israel. It is not you who supports the root, the root supports you. 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Here's a look towards the future. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are of the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Here's the mystery. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. There's the future, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And here's the key, verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Praise the Lord, right? Because if the gifts and calling given to Israel are irrevocable, then they are irrevocable, the ones that are given to us as well. This passage, which is written to the church, makes several statements that are very, very clear. God has not rejected his people, Israel, verse 1. Verses 17 through 18, Israel still has a prominent place in the heart and plan of God. And therefore, those of us in the church need to not become arrogant but remember that we were grafted in and the root supports us. There have been, sadly, horrific episodes in history where self-proclaimed Christians have become arrogant towards the nation of Israel and towards the Jews, even to the point of striking blows against God's chosen people. That is nothing more than a man sitting on a branch and sawing off the limb. Don't swing an axe at God's chosen people, for they are the root that hold you up and the branches that you've been grafted into. Over and over it says, don't become arrogant. I say this so that you won't be wise in your estimation. Don't think that you are better than them. Verses 25 through 27 have a prophecy of the future repentance of Israel that will begin when the two witnesses come during the tribulation, right? The church age ends with the, with the rapture, and then the two witnesses come. They preach to Israel, and 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe are saved, and then they go out and preach the gospel to the rest of the world, and there's a massive revival, especially amongst the Jews and then when Christ comes, the prophecy of Zechariah will be fulfilled when it says that they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Verse 29 of Romans 11, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, there is yet a future for Israel. There are promises God made to them that have not yet been fulfilled and God will indeed fulfill all of those promises to them in the millennial kingdom. So our third premise is that God will faithfully keep every promise he made to Israel, and that is a precious truth because 
it gives us confidence that he will keep every promise he has made to the church. Fourth and last premise as we close here, extreme theological positions have negative practical effects, right? Extreme theological positions have negative practical effects, right? In the opening illustration, I talked about the two planes, right, that take you in different directions. You not only need to get on the right plane, but you need to land at the right airport, right? Don't overfly the airport and go too far, right? Don't go to hyper-dispensationalism. Hyper-dispensationalism begins to chop up the Bible so much that things like the Sermon on the Mount are said to not have any application to the church today. So there are negative practical effects from extreme the theological positions. Fortunately, hyperdispensationalism was a very small movement and a very temporary one. There are very, very, very few hyperdispensationalists today. But I'm glad that our doctrinal statement puts the warning in there, right? We reject any teaching that equates the New Testament church with Old Testament Israel. That's covenant theology, right? That's getting on the wrong plane. And any teaching that rejects water baptism and or the Lord's Supper as ordinance for the church today, that's hyperdispensationalism. Well, I want to close with a, just a few ideas. This is not merely a theological debate. It's not merely theological systems. The real difference between them is in how we interpret the Bible. Do we take certain types of passages, prophetic passages, for example, or certain books of the Bible, such as the book of Revelation? Do we take certain passages in the Old Testament prophets? And do we interpret them differently than we do the rest of the Scripture? In other words, should we have a consistent hermeneutic where we interpret the Scriptures literally, right, grammatically, historically? Or do we need, as the covenant theologians recommend, to interpret didactic passages one way and prophetic passages a different way? Ultimately, the reason that we are where we're at on this issue is because we believe in a consistent grammatical historical hermeneutic, a way of interpreting Scripture in which we take God at His word. When He promises to Israel, we take those as ironclad promises that will be fulfilled. And when He promises to us, we take those as ironclad promises that must be fulfilled. That's kind of the main takeaway I want you to have is a consistent hermeneutic or a consistent way of interpreting the Bible. And then there's a practical one, and it's the one that we read at least three times in Romans 11. Don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. It's interesting to me, Paul is talking about Israel and the church, and he has a spiritual application three times in the passage, and then again at the end, he talks about humility. He ends chapter 11 saying, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a promise-keeping God. Lord, we, we think about the fact that so many of your people did reject you. They did shout crucify. Lord, the mouths of so many Israelites shouted crucify, and then the hands of Gentiles, uh, the ancestors of many of us, put hammer and nail to hand. Lord, the rejection of the Son of God was complete and universal, except for a remnant by your gracious choice. How grateful we are. Lord, it was that Jewish remnant, those early apostles, all of whom were Jews, who brought the message of Christ to us who are Gentiles. Lord, help us in humility to remember that it is not us who supports the root, but the root supports us. As we read the Old Testament and your promises, Lord, may we marvel 
Lord, at your grace, your grace to graft us in and your grace to have a future fulfillment of all of your good and precious promises to your people. We look forward, Lord, to what you will do. We look forward, Lord, to what you have next for us, which is the rapture of the church. And we look forward, Lord, to worshiping you for your faithfulness in fulfilling all of your promises to Israel and the millennial kingdom. And so, Lord, we worship you and acknowledge you as the promise-keeping God and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.